All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning. Um, I'm Phil Wong. I'm the Health Authority and Medical Director with the uh, City of Austin Health and Human Services Department. And it's really an honor for me to be here to welcome you and introduce our speaker. You know, you might ask, why is the Health and Human Services Department sort of involved in this? And, and this is a great partnership that we really uh, embrace and, and value that we've had with planning and zoning and, and other departments in Austin because, you know, really all of the built environment, all of the things that happen uh, affect health. And so we always talk about making the healthy choice the easy choice, and this partnership with planning and zoning is just a perfect example of that. And so the whole reason we're here today is really to talk about, uh, you know, the Imagine Austin 30-year uh, plan, and, and this is part of the Imagine Austin speaker series. Um, and this is a series of talks uh, that are presented annually by nationally known experts in the fields of land use, transportation, development, public health, the economy, the built and natural environment, social equity, and sustainability. And again, all of those really have also uh, imp important impacts on health, which we value. Uh, the City of Austin conducts these speaker events to promote and implement the Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan, which was adopted by uh, City Council in 2012. And so this, this event is hosted by City of Austin Planning and Zoning Department and also Austin Travis County Health and Human Services Department. So again, it's a, it's a partnership we value tremendously. So I'm really uh, privileged and honored to introduce our speaker uh, to this morning. Mayor Mick Cornett is the four-term mayor of Oklahoma City. You know, Newsweek magazine called Mayor Cornett one of the five most innovative mayors in the United States. Politico placed him on the publication's Politico 50 list of thinkers, doers, and visionaries transforming American politics in 2015. Uh, since becoming mayor, he spearheaded major initiatives to improve the city's schools and streets and promote healthy living. Beginning in 2007, he famously put the entire city on a diet to raise awareness on the national issue of obesity and motivated citizens to lose over a million pounds. His TED Talk on those topics has been viewed by more than 1.4 million people nationwide or worldwide. Uh, his commitment to improving the health of this community, his community led to the investment of nearly $2 billion in schools and quality of life infrastructure through the Innovative Metropolitan Area Pro Projects Program. Uh, MAPS, which has generated nearly $6 billion in private sector investments and revivable of a walkable downtown in Oklahoma City. MAPS projects have included a 70-acre downtown park, senior wellness centers, river sports improvements, hike and bike trails, and more sidewalks. He also led the implementation of MAPS for kids and supported efforts to remove fried foods from Oklahoma City school lunch menus, increase availability of healthy snacks, and is also working to increase opportunities for physical activity by adding new gymnasiums to all inner city elementary schools. So please join me in welcoming Mayor Cornett. Can you hear me now? There we go. Well, thank you. It is, it is good to be back in Austin. Uh, being as old as I am, I've had, you know, probably once a year or every couple of years my entire life, I've been in Austin for one reason or another and have seen the tremendous growth. In fact, I, I, I have a, the, the, the smallest connection to the city of Austin you can possibly imagine. When I was going to school, I was graduating at the University of Oklahoma, and I was running a little bit ahead of my schedule, and so I was going to graduate a, a, a semester early, but I had to take a correspondence course. Now, people as young as the people in this room don't know what that is, but prior to the Internet, you actually could take a course by mail, and I needed three hours to finish my degree, and so I took a correspondence course. My first job after, after college was in Bryan, Texas, and so I was in Bryan working at the, the local television station there, and I had to take a course. My correspondence final had to be on a campus that was approved, and so I had to come to UT to take my final class. So when it's politically advantageous, I tell people I finished up at the University of Texas. <coughs> and for, I was there for two hours. <coughs> um, I, I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, I mean, Austin is, is a city that I think uh, metros all over America have studied and have envied for years. You know, the... The, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, obviously, the population growth is something that, that we have all kept an eye on, and the tech industry is something we have all pursued. So Austin has so many things that, that other cities envy to, to emulate. <clears throat> Let me clear my throat just a second. <clears> throat> 
Yeah, sure, get some water just in case I need it. Um, <clears throat> but I'm interested, I, it, how many of you have, have been to Oklahoma City? Okay, well, most of you. How many of you have not been to Oklahoma City and have no idea who I am? <clears throat> <clears throat> well, a few of you. Well, let me give you a little bit of a background. Um, you've heard the saying, I'm sure, Rome was not built in a day. Well, we were. Quite literally, on a spring day in 1889, the federal government held what it called a land run. And so a land run is when they settled these unoccupied lands, and they literally asked the settlers to line up across an imaginary line, and they fired off a gun at high noon, and the settlers roared across the countryside, and they put a stake in the ground. And wherever they put that stake was their new home. The population of Oklahoma City went from zero to 10,000 in one day. And our planning department is still paying for that. <clears throat> it wasn't the best of ideas. You can imagine the calamity at the land's claim office at the end of that first day, with almost every piece of property having a multiple claimant uh, standing out there complaining. Uh, the citizens got together, though, and they elected a mayor. And then they shot him. That's, that's not that funny, but I, I appreciate the feedback. It kind of lets me know what type of audience I'm dealing with. Um, the, the Oklahoma City grew very quickly in those early days, but if you look back at Oklahoma City's history, it has always been sort of this boom and bust environment, and I think it's because we had always tied our, our economy to a commodity, and when you tie your economy to a commodity, you're economy goes up and down with the prices of the commodities. So early on, it was the price of cotton. Later, it was the price of wheat. And ultimately, the price of oil and natural gas. We did have some enterprising entrepreneurs in Oklahoma City. Um, we have been a city of innovation. I bet you did not know that the shopping cart was invented in Oklahoma City. Yeah. The parking meter was invented in Oklahoma City. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, we had an enterprising gentleman at the Chamber of Commerce, thank you, named uh, Stanley Draper. Stanley worked decades at the Chamber and really became kind of a civic icon. But he, he, was, he had such a vision. In the 1920s, when he started working at the Chamber, he saw the road construction boom that was taking place. Route 66 was being constructed in that time period, up in the, 19, up in the end of the 1930s. And Stanley, with all these road building crews going around, he literally went to the sites of the road construction and helped make sure that all roads led to Oklahoma City, if you can imagine. And if you look at a road map today, it does look like all roads lead to Oklahoma City, even then. And you wonder, what would have happened had Stanley not had the foresight to see the future of transportation and how important those corridors were going to be? In the 1940s, Stanley heard that a visiting Army general was going to be landing at our airport on his way to the West Coast. And so Stanley thinking, I'll go out and I'll you know, welcome him to Oklahoma City. This was a 1939, 1940 period. And in shaking the general's hand, the general kind of looked around and, you know, there wasn't a whole lot to see in, in the western edge of Oklahoma City at the time. And he said, you know what we really need is an Air Force base halfway between Washington and L.A. Stanley went back to the office, started making some calls, and just a few years later, Tinker Air Force Base was created. And today, it's our largest employer when you add the public and private sector jobs together. 40,000 people work at this aviation hub, including some of the highest technology that our Defense Department is doing anywhere in the world. And again, you wonder back to Stanley shaking the general's hand and, and deciding to come back and make an impact. He also worked with a powerful U.S. Senator in Washington named Robert S. Kerr in the 1950s and 60s. And between the two of them, they started building dams and building reservoirs in the state of Oklahoma. And today, we have more water than we will ever need for the next century reservoir after reservoir. Many of them have never been tapped for municipal water use because the water is not needed yet. But again, they saw the future. They saw the future of transportation, the future of jobs, the future of water, 
And ultimately, they have set Oklahoma City up on a course for success by taking care of some of those ingredients. Well, because of Oklahoma City's economy that went up and down, I grew up in Oklahoma City, and in the 1970s, we were one of those booming periods. Those of you who are not old enough to remember, OPEC had started this court cartel in the Middle East, and the price of oil started going up and up and up. Now, if you're in Oklahoma City, and people are talking about scarcity and how we're running out of oil and natural gas, and that the price is never going to retreat, you're thinking to yourself, this is a really good thing for us. Because we knew the state had an abundance of oil and natural gas, we had corporate headquarters of these energy companies, and it seemed like the good times were never going to end. And then they did. Boy, did they ever end. On a single day in 1982, we had a bank fail. It was called Penn Square Bank. It was a shopping center bank. Didn't look all that important if you were just driving by, but it was a catalyst for the rest of the decade, and over 200 banks failed in the 1980s. If you can imagine a, a state the size of Oklahoma having 200 banks fail in one decade. Along with our banking economy, down went the energy industry as oil went from $40 a barrel to 10. So you can imagine the energy industry was pretty much non-existent by the end of the decade. And our commercial real estate industry was pretty much underwater. Almost every deal uh, was, was upside down. And so, you know, you lose your real estate, you lose your banking, and you lose your top industry, and you can imagine where Oklahoma City's economy was by the end of the 1980s. It was probably the worst economy in the United States. <clears throat> well, in the midst of all that, the citizens elected a business-minded mayor named Ron Norick in 1987. Now, Ron, his, his father had been mayor, but it would be wrong to imply that they were some sort of political dynasty. They were business people. They owned a printing business and were quite successful. But Ron took this job in 1987 at the, at the, Oklahoma's, at the bottom of Oklahoma City's economy. The job paid $1,200 a year. And we had uh, just had the largest bank in Oklahoma collapse in the middle of downtown Oklahoma City. I don't mean physically collapse. I mean the, the, the ledger collapsing. And so, you know, he had to have been a little crazy. To, to assume the role of mayor at this particular juncture in Oklahoma City's history. And he came to office under the idea that he was going to create jobs. He didn't necessarily know how he was going to do it, but he knew we had to create jobs. And so, lo and behold, within a couple of years, United Airlines announced the largest economic development opportunity of the decade. It was going to be a maintenance facility. And so imagine if you're in Oklahoma City and your economy is struggling and you can't seem to find anything going, all of a sudden, here's a prize that Oklahoma City wants to pursue. Now, this economic development deal was a big one. Five to 8,000 jobs. The annual economic impact to the fortunate city that could land this maintenance facility was going to be about a billion dollars. And this is 1990 dollars. I mean, this, this is a huge opportunity for, for whatever city can, can land it. And so, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of creative economic development incentive packages at the time. So the mayor had this idea. He went to the citizens and asked them if they would pass a sales tax just basically to give to United Airlines. It was going to be a penny in the dollar sales tax for three years that would have created at the time about $125 million. The state decided they would get into the incentives for, the, for this project for Oklahoma City. The governor called a special session of the legislature to pump up the incentive package for, for United Airlines. And so United is, is sitting in its office in Chicago seeing this incredible pitch by Oklahoma City with about $150 million, 1990 dollars, placed on the table if it will choose Oklahoma City. And so you can imagine with that type of incentive package, as the cities get whittled down, Oklahoma City stays in the hunt. And finally, there's only three cities left on this fateful day in 1990 when United makes its decision. And a press conference is called, and every Oklahoman moves to the edge of their seat, and television starts carrying it live to the Oklahoma City audience, and the president of United Airlines announces they're going to build this facility in Indianapolis. And if there had been any air left in the state of Oklahoma, it was immediately expelled. I mean, this, this seemed like the final straw. What more could, could possibly happen to us 
than the mayor having built up our hopes, spent over a year of his time pursuing this opportunity, and here we are left at the altar. But the mayor did two very proactive things that I think are worth noting. The first thing he did was insist that United Airlines tell us what happened. Where did we go wrong? We thought we had the best incentive package sitting right there in front of you. And United didn't really want to talk about it. I mean, there's no sense in creating hard feelings here at the, at the end of the, at the, of the exercise. And so he said, Mayor, you were the best prepared. You guys were the most polite. You were always on time. You guys didn't do anything wrong. You just finished second. And that wasn't enough. The mayor said, no, we've, we've got to know. We want to learn from this. You know, and so maybe the next one comes along. We'll do better. We'll, we'll figure out how to, how to get the next one. And so United Airlines finally came clean. They said that they had sent some mid-level executives and their spouses into Oklahoma City to spend a weekend and then report back to corporate headquarters what they saw. And they filed a report, and it went to the board of directors. And at the end of the discussion, they came to the conclusion they just couldn't imagine their employees living there. Well, that was kind of the kick in the teeth that the mayor needed to hear. So he did his second proactive thing. He went to Indianapolis. Now, he did not move there, although at this stage of his political career, I can assure you it must have crossed his mind. What he saw in Indianapolis was a downtown that had vitality. There were hotels and restaurants. There was water features with a canal. There were sports arenas and sports teams. At 5 o'clock, when Oklahoma City went dark downtown, Indianapolis was just getting started. The, 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 vi the vibrancy of the urban core was just so impressive. And that's when we really took a good look at our downtown. Boy, was it depressing. We had one hotel at the time downtown, and it was struggling to stay open. There were basically no restaurants, no retail. Almost everyone had moved to the suburbs, and we had become a suburb of nothing in Oklahoma City. And so the mayor now realized there had been a paradigm shift in economic development ventures in the United States. Indianapolis had figured it out before Oklahoma City. We had been under the impression that people would move to where the jobs were, so we were trying to create jobs. What had happened was people were moving and living where they wanted to live, and jobs were going to where the people were. Well, that's a whole different ballgame. Now, he learned from that penny-in-the-dollar sales tax that he passed for the incentive package. He realized the citizens were willing to invest in something. They were willing to invest in, in doing something dramatic. Leadership just had to put a different type of package together. Now, that sales tax for United, of course, was never implemented because... United didn't choose Oklahoma City. So the mayor went back and he, he put together nine projects into one package and put it before the voters that went to the election in, in 1993. Now, this was called MAPS, Metropolitan Area Projects. So the idea was the citizens would vote, and if they passed it, they got all nine projects. And if it failed, they got none of them, and the sales tax would never be implemented. Well, City Hall at this point had absolutely zero political capital. I mean, the citizens just couldn't imagine a city government that was failing on the, the daily services. Remember, budgets had been cut year after year after year. You can imagine the level of services that existed in Oklahoma City from city government at that time. There, there was really no reason other than the mayor's goodwill to believe that the city could pull this off, could actually build these things that they were describing. But it was things like a new sports arena, a new minor league baseball stadium, uh, some improvements at our fairgrounds, uh, some improvements at our Performing Arts Center. There was going to be a new downtown library. Uh, there was going to be a transportation element to it. Uh, there was going to be a canal, kind of a San Antonio-styled uh, canal, to go through an old boarded-up warehouse district that was adjacent to downtown. The mayor even had the audacity to believe that we could put water in the river. Now, if you live in Austin, that doesn't make sense to you because you have a river with water. Most cities do. I know I grew up in, in looking at my geography books and seeing all the rivers of the world. You know, geography books in middle school are really big on rivers, and they show all these cities and magnificent waterways. And, and I wondered why we had this big ditch downtown that the, that the grown-ups called the river. And turns out, in the 1920s, our river had been an actual flowing 
body of water, but it had flooded. It flooded in the spring of 23, and it flooded in the fall of 23. And the civic leaders went to the Corps of Engineers and said, you got to help us. you got to make sure this river doesn't flood anymore. Well, they did. They took all the water out of the river and left us with a big ditch downtown. And the city of Oklahoma City actually had a line item in its budget to mow the river twice a year. <laughs> Mayor Norick's idea was to build three low-water dams in pound water. And so even though we still wouldn't have a, a river that water flowed freely, at least there would be water in the river. And this was like a brand-new concept for people in Oklahoma City. And so the campaign is controversial. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's not that there's a funded opponent. It's that the, the, the opponents didn't need one. I mean, the whole idea was laughable to so many people that Oklahoma City was going to build all of these, these things. And, you know, who did Oklahoma City really think it was? Didn't it realize its place in, in, the, in the world's uh, hierarchy? And so the mayor, realizing that the things are polling so badly, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean the, the public meetings were just a disaster. Uh, I mean, people were, you know, were against, they were against uh, convention centers improvements because they didn't want strangers coming to town. Um, you know, they, they, they didn't want, uh, they didn't want, uh, to, they, they didn't want improvements made downtown because they didn't like downtown. It was scary down there. Well, of course it was scary. There was, there was nothing going on down there. If you go downtown, you're the only one there. That's scary. And so the idea that we were going to invite people downtown, just people just couldn't comprehend this in 1993. And so finally, in kind of an exasperated state, the mayor kind of went to the citizens with this last pitch plea. To, to vote for, for this, this, this crazy concept. And he said, look, look, look at it this way. Even if no one ever comes to Oklahoma City and starts a job because of maps, even if no one ever moves to Oklahoma City to start a business because of maps, the worst case scenario is we'll have a better city for us. Well, that was kind of a common sense, plain talking type of, of, uh, of uh, political pitch that the citizens seemed to adapt to. And so they call the election, and they, the, the tallies come in, and MAPS passes with 53% of the vote. The interesting thing is today, you cannot find the people who will admit they voted against it, because ultimately it would change everything. But it was not an immediate success. In fact, sure enough, Mayor Norick had overpromised how fast the projects could be delivered, he had underestimated the cost of the projects. We had a citizen oversight board that, you know, you, I'm sure you understand, they got a little bit overconfident and started calling press conferences on their own. And it was a public relations disaster. If, if, you're, if your initiative is over budget and behind schedule, there aren't many other things, bad things that can go wrong. But that's, that's what MAPS was in the initial months. It was a unique funding process in that we were going to collect the money and then spend it. And so there's no debt with any of the MAPS proposals that we've done. And so that's, that's well and good. And in a conservative political environment, that sells really well to the voters. The problem is it takes a long time to build the projects when you do it that way. Because you can't hire a consultant or an engineer until the money has been collected. And then you've got nine projects going. I and mean, this was a massive project. And so in the months and even a year or two into MAPS, it is highly controversial and mostly negative. In fact, I suspect if the citizens could have voted again, they would have voted it back out a year or two after the original MAPS vote. And in the wake of this calamity and this kind of uncertain and negative time in Oklahoma City's history, we're struck with the largest act of domestic terrorism in the United States history. Bomb goes off downtown. 168 people are murdered at 9 o'clock on a Wednesday morning. And so I think it's interesting to kind of take a snapshot at Oklahoma City at this particular point in time. This was a generation of people that had already been through the economic collapse of the 80s. They'd been promised hope with United Airlines and had those hopes dashed. They'd been promised hope with this MAPS proposal but here we were a year or two later, and MAPS hadn't produced anything that was positive. And now, placed on their shoulders, is the emotional burden of this incredibly large mass murder. And America's eyes all on Oklahoma City, but not for any reason that anybody would want. 
And something very interesting that I think we, we didn't really see until years later looking back at it. Something very interesting happened in Oklahoma City in the months and years following the bombing. It's almost as if the people of that city grabbed hands and pulled each other up and dared the world to pull us apart. The unity that emerged from those collective life experiences has been sort of a secret ingredient in Oklahoma City that has been very tough for our peer cities to emulate. And the way I describe it is just as two people who go through an emotional situation have a certain bond, a certain aspect of that relationship that only the two of them understand. This was an entire city that had gone through that emotional experience that only people in Oklahoma City seemed to really understand how important it was to stick together at that particular junction. Well, the MAPS projects start moving along. They start opening up, and people start thinking, hey, this, this wasn't such a bad deal. They kind of like the ballpark, and all of a sudden, they can see dams, and that the water's going to have river, and, and uh, the river's going to have water. And Mayor Norick leaves office after three terms, and the, his predecessor comes to office, and he watches as the MAPS projects begin to open, and all of a sudden, there's occasionally a reason to come downtown. But he notices that people aren't repopulating the inner city. People aren't moving downtown. There's now a reason to come down after dark, but there's still no reason to move your family to anywhere near the inner city. Life in the suburbs was still okay. Some would even say flourishing in some pockets. But downtown was still a, a pretty um, uh, unfortunate place. And by downtown, I mean even, you know, a few miles from the urban core. And so the mayor had a very important conversation with an assistant city manager. When he was exasperated about repopulating the inner city and trying to figure out why MAPS hadn't accomplished this goal of repopulating downtown. And the assistant city manager said, Mayor, you can pave these streets with gold, but if we don't do something about the image of the inner city school district, people aren't moving back. And again, that was kind of the kick in the teeth that the mayor needed to hear. And it was true. In fact, the mayor had been a graduate of that school district, but things had changed. And in city after city all over America, we, we saw very similar things usually. Inner city families moving to the suburbs on the perception that they could get a better education for their kids. And you do that over and over again, and pretty soon thousands of people have left, and the momentum is just unbelievable. And, of course, in Oklahoma City, with all these roads, we don't have any traffic congestion. So 10, minutes is, 10 miles is 10 minutes, and et cetera. And so people are, are, are void. And so we have this huge donut of, of population. And so the mayor comes up and working with the city staff on the next MAPS initiative called MAPS for Kids. And in this one, he intends to rebuild all of the inner city schools. So all 75 buildings that were in that inner city school district have now been refurbished or built anew. And again, the citizens had to vote for this in a, in a, in a very complicated political funding mechanism. And I usually don't get into this, but with this audience, I'm going to go ahead and describe it because I think you'll understand. He needed the votes of the people that lived in Oklahoma City but outside the school district, that inner city school district. He needed their yes votes to pass it. So how is he going to get people that lived outside the district to fund improvements for another district? How is he going to get this buy-in of, of, of tax dollars and emotional buy-in to understand how important it was? And I think largely because of the bombing and that emotional experience and the unity that it created, it, it allowed such a cooperation, a cooperative element. Now, keep in mind, the mayor went to the 24 school districts that serve kids that live inside our city limits. He got them all to approve a funding plan that was disproportionate. In other words, most of the money went to the inner city district and the suburban districts all got a, a small slice of the pie. He got 24 school districts to agree to that funding plan. You know how hard it is to get one school district to agree to something? I would, I would suggest that only in, a, in an environment like Oklahoma City had been through could you get such, such cooperation. Could you get people to work together toward one common goal? He went to the voters, and it passed over 62%. 
the, the school district had so much deferred maintenance in its system because they had not passed a bond issue in decades. And you can imagine if you have 75 buildings and you're not putting any money into deferred maintenance, what your buildings start to look like. Um, the city, in a sense, loaned its political capital, which was now growing because of the MAPS projects, on behalf of that school district. Because our business leaders realized that the city was not going to progress as long as that inner city school district was falling apart. That we had to put our arms around it. And we could all say it wasn't our problem. You know, it, it was easy to say that's the school district's problem. You know, the city doesn't run the schools, that's their problem. It would have been easy for the business leaders to say it's not my problem, my kids are in private schools or they're in suburban schools, because they were. But we realized that that inner city district was going to be, was becoming the city's problem. And so the, the funding was passed, and the school district was able to pass a bond issue on the same night because of the, of the campaign. And over $700 million have been put into the schools, and now every school building in that district has been built anew or refurbished. And when you think about this, and again, I'm getting a little bit deeper than I typically do because of the nature of this audience, this was really construction in 75 neighborhoods. And almost every one of these neighborhoods hadn't had any new construction in a long, long time. And so it became a catalyst for people taking better care of their property. And, and for in many cases now, when you go back and study it, new development has, has emerged. And you wonder if that even would have been possible without this incredible program of funding uh, 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 tax dollars for these 75 schools. And the MAPS, project, MAPS for Kids projects are now in the final phases. Again, it takes us a long time to, to build those projects. MAPS uh, for Kids was passed in 2001, and uh, the administration building, which is the last of the projects, uh, is uh, about to, uh, to take place. So um, we took care of downtown. We started working on the schools. And then in 2004, the citizens in, in this rare collective lack of judgment elected me. <laughs> and so... The, the city that I sort of in, inherited in a political sense from my incredible predecessors, you could tell it was, it was just starting to emerge as, as a city worth taking notice of. In other words, it was, it was just starting to become relevant in a large conversation about emerging cities. And I noticed that because Oklahoma City started showing up on the lists. Now, the lists are, um, what I'm referring to is magazines and websites love to rank cities. You know, best city to do this, best city to do that. And, you know, if you live in a city, you can't, you can't help but try and find your city on there. And I'm, I'm sure you're, you're the same way. If you see a city, you kind of want to see where your city is. And all of a sudden, Oklahoma City's on this list, like best place to get a job, you know, and we'd be on the list somewhere. Best place to start a business, and you look down, and there we are, you know. Best downtown, and all of a sudden, you know, Oklahoma City is... And, you know, we weren't near the top in any of these lists, but God, we've never been on a list before. I mean, <laughs> this was really cool. And so being the civic booster that the new mayor was, I'm out trying to talk about the, all the improvements that we've made. I'm trying to explain that, that Oklahoma City is in a position to really do something special because of these in, incredible investments that they and city government have made. And... As I'm using these lists to kind of validate my story, and people are kind of tired of me, you know, standing up, holding one more list, trying to explain how Oklahoma City is, is somebody, out comes the list of the most obese cities in the country. And there we were. Now, we weren't at the top of the list, and I like to point out we were on that list with a lot of really cool places, um, you know. Houston, Dallas, I don't remember if Austin was on the list, but could have been. Uh, New Orleans, Atlanta, Miami. I mean, you know, these are cities that generally you're not ashamed to be associated with. But who wants to be on the list of the most obese cities in the country? Especially when you're the mayor that was talking about how important these lists are. And all of a sudden, the media is now placing microphones in front of me, trying to get me to explain what happened, why are we on this list, and what am I going to do about it? And, of course, I had absolutely no idea. I had no answer. I mean, it seemed like such a massive problem that I didn't really understand, was not prepared for. 
I was about jobs and I was about education. That's what I was about. You know, health was somebody else's problem. And about that time, I got on the scales. And I weighed like 220 pounds. And I went to this website, you know, one of those federal government websites, and I typed in my height. I think I cheated about a half inch. But I typed in my height, and I typed in my weight, and I hit enter, and it said, obese. But what a stupid website. I'm not obese. I would know if I was obese. And then for like the very first time, I start getting honest with myself about my problems with weight gain as an adult. And I start studying it and thinking about it. And all of a sudden, I realized that I'd gotten into this pattern as an adult where I would gain two or three pounds a year. And then about every 10 years, I would take off 20 or 30 pounds. And I'd repeat the cycle. And as a result, I had this incredibly large closet full of clothes that I could not wear. And so only I knew which third of the closet was appropriate for whatever weight I was carrying at the time. But all of this seems so normal to me because, you know, when you're going through it, you don't think about the fact that you can't wear most of the clothes in your closet at any one time in your life. I also noticed one other thing that was, that was a little concerning. As mayor, and I'd been mayor a couple of years at this point, I wasn't gaining two or three pounds a year. I was gaining 10 pounds a year because everybody wants to feed the mayor. And the mayor was eating. And I realized if I was going to be mayor very long, I was going to be a really large mayor. And so, you know, I thought to myself, I really need to do something about this. And, I, and now, you know, I'm more embarrassed because here's the city on this list of obese cities in the country. And here I am an example. I'm an example of the problem. I mean, that's not good. I'm sure they're going to be the spokesperson for the city. And here's this, 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 uh, this negative list, and all they have to do is look at me and see, you know, I'm, I'm part of the problem. And so I decided, well, I've got to lose weight. And I knew I could lose weight because I'd lost weight, you know, several times before. And so I just stopped eating as much. I'd been eating about 3,000 calories a day, and I cut it to 2,000, and the weight came right off. I lost about a pound a week for 40 weeks. But in the process of kind of taking care of, of my health issue, I started kind of looking at the city with fresh eyes, and I started examining it. And I'm trying to figure out, really, the, the basis, this fundamental question is, why does Oklahoma City have such a problem with obesity? What, what's the deal? Why, why us? And I start looking around and, and noticing the way people conduct themselves and, and the, way the, the, the way the city kind of moved and operated. And I realized that we had built an incredible quality of life at this point. And it was especially incredible if you happened to be a car. <laughs> but if you were a person, you were like seemingly combating the automobile at every turn. And I realized it, almost our entire city had been built around this idea that every person would have a car and every person would drive everywhere they go. And when you looked at the city with kind of fresh eyes and looked at the architecture, you realized every time we built any large building, seemingly, a school, a church, the most important architectural feature seemed to be the automobile drop-off location. That seemed to be where most of the attention was placed. How are we going to get people out of their cars? How much parking is, is this facility going to need? And then someone pointed out to me that we were the fast food capital of the world most fast food restaurants per capita. I had no idea who counted them and, or why they would have, but I'm not arguing. Probably it's true. It does seem like we have a lot of fast food restaurants. But again, it came into that car-centric uh, uh, focus. Now, remember, I talked earlier about Stanley Draper and cr creating this incredible grid of roads. Well, he did. Three interstate highways come into Oklahoma City. If you look on a national map, I think there may be only like one si other city in the country that has three interstate highways intersecting in one specific uh, uh, big city. Uh, we also had basically every state highway coming in. And so we had this natural grid of roads. Well, the idea was traffic flowed so freely that people literally could live, I mean, 20 miles away and still just be 20 minutes from wherever they needed to go. It was in a, and traffic flowed incredibly well. 
And it's as if we had told our civil engineers that their only responsibility was to see how fast they could get a car from here to here. And they were really good at it. The problem was the type of culture that that had created for our community. It was such a car-centric focus that I assure you, I, I raised three boys. And in the 90s, when they were kind of, you know, in their teenage years, if I had suggested to them, let's go around the block, they would have all looked for the car keys. Because the idea that you would walk when you own a car just didn't seem to make sense. Why would you walk when you don't have to? The problem with the built environment was even worse than I've so far described. We had gone decades without requiring developers to build sidewalks in the suburban neighborhoods. Now, we had fixed that in the late 90s, but the damage had been done. I'm guessing there may be a couple of hundred thousand homes in Oklahoma City's city limits that had virtually no level of walkability, no sidewalks. So the result was we built, we built neighborhoods and schools. We built neighborhoods and shopping centers. We built neighborhoods and churches, neighborhoods and libraries, and we hadn't connected any of it with any sort of pedestrian-friendly amenity. When you look downtown, it was really scary. We had basically six-lane roads. Almost all of them were one way. It was as if, again, our civil engineers had been told, see how fast you can get people into downtown and then see how fast you can get people out of downtown. And it moved really fast. The problem was if you needed to cross the street on foot. I can remember hitting the walk, don't walk sign in downtown Oklahoma City. And remember, you're crossing six lanes of road. And so finally, you know, the, the red light would come and you'd get, and you'd take like three steps and all of a sudden it was flashing. In other words, hurry. And so you take a few more steps and by now you're losing confidence in how long it's going to give you to cross the street. So you just start running. Because you're, you're afraid at any moment the light's going to turn green and you're going to get run over. But that's kind of the environment that the pedestrian was facing in downtown Oklahoma City. I mean, cars went so fast and the streets were so wide. And you know why they were wide? In 1889, when they laid out that city with the land run, they, they had to make it that wide because a horse and buggy needed room to make a U-turn. And they never narrowed the streets. And so this was downtown Oklahoma City and kind of the, the environment that, that, you know, we were trying to make a, a business-friendly uh, uh, situation. And so as I'm studying all, all of what's going on, I realize just what a massively overwhelming problem this appears to be. You know, when we showed up on the list, it seemed like an issue. When I was overweight, it seemed like something I needed to take care of. Now that I've had a look around and trying to realize it, and it kind of feels like I'm the only one who's kind of noticed all these things all at once, this is scary because we're not going to turn around this community. It's not going to start prioritizing health as long as the built environment looks like what it is. And so you're thinking, well, you know, that's the, that, you know, the, the cost of that, of changing all that. You can't just change your built environment. I mean, there's, that's, that's not possible. And I also noticed one thing, other thing about obesity is that we weren't talking about it. I mean, I was thinking about it, but really we weren't talking about it. And I think it's because, you know, we're nice people, and talking about obesity kind of a, is about the way people look, and it's not nice to talk negatively about the way people look. And so our kind of unannounced strategy about obesity was to just ignore it and hope it would go away on its own. And I had absolutely no confidence that it was going to go away on its own at this point. And so I realized, you know, this is such an overwhelming problem. I don't really know how to combat it, but I do know this. We've got to start talking about it. That's got to be the first step in whatever we're going to do. And so um, I started putting together a plan of, of a way that we could get people talking about obesity. And I, I had a friend who had made a, a living in the healthcare industry, and he kind of wanted to give something back. And he mentioned to me that he was interested in, in obesity as an issue. And so he funded privately a website for me that would uh, allow people to kind of do whatever programming I could come up with. And so I, um, on, on December 31st of 2007, I went to the Oklahoma City Zoo, and I stood in front of the elephants, 
and I announced this city is going on a diet and we're going to lose a million pounds. And that's when all hell broke loose. Um, now, uh, the, the, the website that we created was called This City Is, this city is Going on a Diet.com. You can see how creative I am. <laughs> and, and the website allowed people to sign up, pledge to lose weight. It had all sorts of nutritional information and, and exercise opportunities and, and was trying to, you know, kind of be a clearinghouse for people who were interested in improving their health, but, may, but mostly just uh, trying to get people that were, that were overeating to get information about what, what their dietary uh, needs were and what they were actually eating. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, the, the first few days, it was, was kind of like this kind of stunned, um, uh, uh, this kind of stunned uh, cloud over the city. It was almost as if, though, the people the next day at the water cooler were saying, did you hear what the crazy mayor did? He put us on a diet. Can he do that? But what happened was the conversation began. And suddenly you could kind of sense, and we would get anecdotal information that husband and wives were now talking about it for the first time. And then they're talking about it with their kids. And they're talking about it over the backyard fence with their neighbor. And church pastors now kind of feel like they have an opportunity to talk about it on Sundays. And they can develop support groups through the church. Business leaders, remember your largest business leaders aren't the problem here. They already have HR departments. They have wellness campaigns. They're doing all sorts of things health-related for their employees. But there's thousands of small and mid-sized businesses that don't, don't have HR departments. They still care about their employees, but they don't have any program in place. Well, they were able to use our program to interact with their employees on a, on a health and, and fitness type of, of effort. And the way our website was set up, they could actually compete department by department, or they could compete with another business, or neighborhood could compete with another neighborhood. And people signed up, and the website kind of tracked their success. And so as you typed in your new weight, it would you know, kind of cheer you on and show you know, this path, this new trajectory of losing weight that you were on. Um, the national media, to their credit, was very, very helpful because they could easily have, have seen what I did and decided to make fun of us. In other words, they could have said, that city is so fat that the mayor had to put everybody on a diet and gotten a big laugh out of it. But instead, the national media really focused on us and said, look, this is a problem in a lot of places. This is a city that's trying to do something about it. And so they, they really offered a lot of support. I wound up on the, on the Ellen DeGeneres show, who I didn't even know had a show at this point. I end up on her show in Los Angeles. And on that day, 150,000 people went to the website and started, you know, making, uh, you know, uh, committing to, to improve their sense. The media was very important because one of the problems with government efforts on health and, and obesity is that it's hard to get them through one media cycle. In other words... You can announce something and get some attention today, but how are you going to get it next week and the week after that? How do you keep the media interested? We would hold press conferences every three months. We would bring in some examples of people who had lost the most weight. And, you know, these were people that had lost, you know, at pretty soon over 100 pounds. I mean, these lives were changed. And the media loves weight loss stories. And so they were able to, to continue moving. Our, the private sector reacted positively, not just the Chamber of Commerce and the business community, and this is one thing I didn't see coming, the restaurants. Every restaurant wanted to be a part of it. Now, you'd think they wouldn't think this was such a great idea. You know, the mayor puts everybody on a diet. You know, how's that good for us? But it seemed like the, it challenged the chefs in our community to come up with, with healthier options on the, on the menus. And so literally, most of the top restaurants had a mayor special at lunch. And whatever they chose to make the mayor special, the owners were telling me, it's the top seller of the week. The restaurants wanted to be a part of, of this improvement. And so the weight starts coming off, and thousands of people are engaged, and it seems like we're doing better. And that's when I realized that we're about to have an opportunity to use that one-cent sales tax, that capacity, to do something on our next uh, uh, MAPS campaign. And so along with the typical economic development drivers, like a new convention center, um, we put several health-related items into MAPS-3. And we also passed a bond issue with health-related ideas. And so I'm going to give you a list of things that we've done, and it's been a variety of, of funding sources. You know, we've tried to be creative in this effort. 
but a lot of it's in MAPS 3. Um, we are, are building four senior health and wellness centers throughout the community. So these are like $10 million a piece. And the idea is to get people in these suburban areas an opportunity to be engaged socially, mentally, and these facilities will be operated by private sector, nonprofit partners, so there's going to be no um, way on the uh, general fund of, of the city. But the idea is to get, you know, give people opportunities to do better with their health and their wellness and all of the other things that, 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 that fall into health. We're completing our bicycle trail master plan. And again, I know this is an audience that will understand. I was on city council before I was elected mayor. So this is like 2002 or so. And I was kind of the new guy on council. I didn't know what I didn't know. And so the staff is, is putting up this, this report about our bicycle trail master plan. And I'd never seen it before. I thought it was really cool. They had the, you know, the map of the city and they're showing this bicycle trail plan. And the reason they were bringing it up there is because we got this federal grant for like, I don't know, a quarter of a million dollars or something. And we were going to build like, you know, a mile of trail at some point. And it seemed really, you know, really nice and it was exciting. And, and, and you know, we were kind of patting ourselves on the back. And then I raised my hand, oblivious to the answer, and said, hey, at the rate we're going, when are we going to finish the bicycle trail master plan? <laughs> well, that's when you heard a few giggles and the, the parks director didn't really know what to say next. And you could tell that by the time we finished the bicycle trail master plan, we were all going to be dead. I mean, we, we, had, we really had no dedicated funding toward ever finishing it. And so I realized with MAPS 3, we have an opportunity just to fund the entire thing. Let's just, let's just build it. It's over 100 miles, you know, total. I mean, by then we'd, we'd done better, but you get the idea. I mean, with MAPS 3, suddenly we had the funding source to complete the entire project. We're also going back into the city and building sidewalks. So we have funding for hundreds of miles of sidewalks throughout the suburban area. We're even going back into the kind of heavily developed first ring and building sidewalks where they weren't built before. And let me tell you, it's expensive to build sidewalks later with curb cuts and utility lines and having to buy easements. You can imagine the expense of, of going into some of your more heavily developed areas that were you know, built in the... 40s and 50s, and then deciding later to put in a nice sidewalk that's ADA compliant and, and fits all the other requirements that we expect today. But we're doing it. I mean, we're spending tens and tens of millions of dollars on sidewalks. In the, in the uh, suburban areas, we now have a new policy, and I don't think this is rocket science, but it was new for us. Um, anytime we're going into a, a, a section line road or a, a, you know, a large street and doing any maintenance, if we're resurfacing it or taking a two-lane road, making it a four-lane road, whatever we're doing, if it at all makes sense to add a sidewalk, we just put the sidewalk in at the, at the same time. Because the idea that you're already at the crews there and adding a sidewalk at that point is not that expensive to the project. And so that's, again, into this hundreds of miles of sidewalks that we're building. Now, down on the river, remember this big ditch that suddenly had, had water? We, uh, we had a rowing enthusiast that caught the eye of a philanthropist and got them to build the first boathouse. And they were actually starting to do some canoe and kayak and rowing out on the river. And people liked it, and it started growing and growing. And today, we have the finest venue in the world for the sports of canoe, kayak, and rowing. We're holding the Olympic trials here in, in two months for kayak. USA Kayak has relocated its headquarters to downtown Oklahoma City to be near this facility that we've created. It turns out that by this ditch was had a very straight, long straightaway, and it's perfect for rowing competitions. And the philanthropists put in tens of millions of dollars into these, this incredible technology that is now the state of the art for these sports. And so athletes and coaches from the world are moving in to be near this complex that, again, didn't even have any water in it 20 years ago. And we're adding what's called a whitewater facility. And a white, it's kind of a man-made kayak facility. So you know Oklahoma City, we don't have any mountains. And so we don't, we don't have rushing water anywhere. Um, but this, we, have the, we have the finest venue now for the sport of kayak, and uh, that's where the Olympic trials will be, will be held here just, just around the corner. Um, we're also building a downtown Central Park that's over 70 acres in size that will be kind of a new community gathering space. We, re, we removed our downtown interstate, moved it five blocks to the south. It opened up this new area for development, and so we're creating this park. It's called Core to Shore. It goes from the core of downtown to the shore of the river that didn't have any water, but now does. 
um, and goes, you know, with the pedestrian bridge over the interstate. It, it's a, it, it connects almost a mile long now series of, of parks and green space in downtown Oklahoma City. We also use TIF financing to redesign all of our downtown streets. So we, we, one of our energy companies was constructing an incredibly large tower, like 900 feet. And uh, they didn't want the TIF money for themselves or for any of their infrastructure. They wanted us to kind of improve the downtown landscape. And so we've been able, with that and some bond money, to redesign all of our downtown streets. And so we've taken all the one-way streets and made them two-way. We've narrowed them. We've heavily landscaped them. And we've given the pedestrian a fighting chance uh, in, in downtown Oklahoma City. And so uh, today, when you're downtown, if you don't see construction, because we're not quite through on all that, we're mostly through, what you see are, are, are you know, basically brand new streets with heavily you know, landscaped with trees that are much more narrow. We have on-street parking and, and basically kind of a complete street project. We have bike lanes you know, where appropriate. And, uh, and just kind of, a, you know, in, 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 again, changing the built environment to you know, be more uh, friendly to pedestrians. We're also building a downtown streetcar. And I think what's, what's mostly interesting when you look around the country at other streetcar projects, we paid cash. Yes, five more minutes. Got it. Okay. We're going to take questions here in just a moment. The streetcar um, is, again, you know, I think fueling the idea that this is a pedestrian-friendly community because it's, it's part of moving people around. And how many of you in here when you were in school read The Grapes of Wrath? Okay, almost everybody. See, I used to think that was something we did to our kids to ensure they would feel bad about themselves. But... <laughs> The, the Grapes of Wrath is what? It's about a story, 1930s, Oklahoma family. You know, they seem like nice people, but they run on hard times, and so they put everything they have on a truck, and they get on Route 66, and they head west. And they're, you know, they're getting out of Oklahoma as fast as they can, and they're going for hope. I mean, they're going for a better future for their kids. Well, interesting today, when you look at the Census Bureau's relocation statistics, uh, it's almost as if we're seeing the Wrath of Grapes. Uh, the next generation or maybe the third generation of people in California, they're coming back. The number of Californians moving to Oklahoma City is amazing, much larger than the number that are going the other way. And that's a dramatic, you know, shift um, in, you know, in population cycles. Um, we are, uh, we're, we're also seeing uh, improvement in, you know, we lost people to Texas. And let me, let me tell you, I graduated from high school in 1976. I graduated from kind of, you know, the affluent suburban public school district of its day. And my classmates are gone. I mean, I don't know where they are. I mean, we have our 40th anniversary or 40th reunion this summer. I guess I'll get to see them again. But in the 80s, you know, especially, you know, these kids that got advanced degrees, there weren't any jobs in Oklahoma City when they came of age. And so they left. And they're in Austin or Dallas or Houston or New York or Tokyo. But they're, for the most part, they're not in Oklahoma City. And so we lost a generation of talent because of that economic collapse in the 1980s. Well, I mean, there's, there's this sense today growing up in Oklahoma City with an NBA team and all of the other quality of life amenities that have now been uh, constructed that the young people want to stay and that their friends from neighboring states are now moving to Oklahoma City to be a part of this incredible quality of life where housing is extremely affordable and there's no traffic and we have an abundance of fresh water and clean air. All these things that people in Oklahoma City have taken for granted for, for, for decades, but we've never been able to have, have the, the built environment that, that would work. And I'll, I'll close with this, and then we'll take questions. But I've been in office a long time now, you can imagine. Um, I've been elected four times to mayor. And um, I've also fronted a lot of initiatives and campaigns and bond issues for the schools and for the city. And so I've had a, a lot of opportunities to you know, be in meetings like this in distant neighborhoods. And... Um, and I noticed at some point not too long ago there was a pattern, a conversation that seemed to, to come up almost every time I had one of these campaigns. And, you know, I'm you know, usually pretty confident. We've got a pretty good track record. I can get out and talk about all this success story. You can usually win people over. But there's always at least one person in the room that isn't quite buying in. And, and I can kind of, you know, it's a picture. I'm, I'm 10 miles away from the urban core I'm in a distant neighborhood, and there's a guy standing up going nose to nose with me, and I can tell right away three things. They don't like downtown. They don't like taxes. And they don't like me. And when I've lost the intellectual argument, 
when I've given them every bullet point I brought to the meeting and I'm getting nowhere. I close with this. I say, well, we're creating a city where your kid and your grandkid are going to choose to live. And boy, do they hate that argument <laughs> because they know it's true. If you were in Oklahoma City, if you survived the 1980s, you saw a lot of young and talented and educated people leave. Not because they wanted to necessarily, but they couldn't get a job. And today, that's not the case. Uh, even with oil prices where they are, the employment people tell me they still have more people looking to hire than they do looking for a job. And we have diversified the economy away from oil and gas and gotten into aviation thanks to the Air Force Base that Stanley Draper helped bring us. And we've gotten into the biomedical and the amount of medical research that's now taking place downtown is, is, uh, is, is really fulfilling. And so our unemployment rate is amongst the lowest in the country. Typically, we battle you guys for, you know, you know in the top five and have for the last five or six years. So um, uh, I'll, I'll pause there and take questions. That's our story. It, I'll, I'll just tell you this. I, I, um, I, you know, I was in Bryan, Texas in 1980. I remember what Austin was like. And I can't, it's amazing how far you've come. The, uh, the ascendancy that Oklahoma City has made in the last 20 years is, is equally remarkable, not in population growth, but just in the way the city looks and feels and the pride that exists today. I don't think any city's come as far as fast as Oklahoma City has. And it's, it's partially because of, of in, in incredible mayors that, that came before me and a, a series of life experiences that, that no one could have expected or, or uh, uh, sought to, to have occur. But uh, today, you know, Oklahoma City is kind of the result of, of, of a lot of citizens that have bought into the idea that you can't be a suburb of nothing and you've got to invest in yourself. And economic development is about the quality of life in your community. I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hey. Wow, what an incredibly compelling story. So we do have a few minutes for questions. 15 minutes okay. for questions. All right, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming and visiting us, Mayor, and uh, thanks for sharing your story about Oklahoma City. I guess I need to go visit now. <laughs> but uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned your experience with the, the food diet program citywide and that the restaurants embrace that with their chefs. But if you could share uh, a little more about that in terms of the fast food culture uh, school lunch programs, and grocery stores, if there's anything specific about those three. Yeah, well, when I was on the Ellen DeGeneres show, the CEO of Taco Bell saw me, and so he calls. And um, I mentioned to him in the conversation that we're the fast food capital of the world. And he says, well, that explains it. And I said, explains what? And he says, why do we have 45 Taco Bells in Oklahoma City? I just couldn't imagine. I said, well, how many people in Oklahoma City go to Taco Bell every day? And he says, 35,000. And I, I'm, so I'm thinking to myself as I'm, you know, I'm taking a deep breath now. And I realized something you know, important from my perception. Remember, I'm not a, a health expert. I have no education in the field of, of health. But I thought to myself, you know, I can't, I can't really change that. I can, I can say anything I want in front of the elephants. People are going to go to Taco Bell. And, but, but our message became... Do, do, make a better choice. In other words, if, even if you still decide to go to Taco Bell, there are still choices to be made about what you eat once you get into Taco Bell. I mean, significant changes in your diet can be made regardless of what restaurants you're in. And so it was about making better choices. And so that's one of the ways that we work with the fast food industry. They ultimately put on a campaign about, about, a, about uh, choosing items with no cheese and no sour cream, and they put a life-size cut out of me in every Taco Bell that said you can't lose a million pounds by yourself. And so when we reached the million pound uh, campaign, it four, took four years and three weeks to reach the million pounds. But the, but the fast food industry was, was very much involved. And what was the second part of your question? School lunch program yep. and uh, grocery stores. Yeah, the, the schools immediately changed their, their, uh, their, you know, their food. And, you know, we had always heard for years that, that, that it was cheaper. And, you know, every time they had a cost savings, the food got worse, and the, the, but, it was a, but it was a monetary thing. Do you want school books or do you want different food? You know, you decide, you know, what you want. Do you want teachers or do you want better food? And finally, I had the superintendent. He just, the superintendent just changed almost overnight. And went changed vendors, changed whatever we can. No, no fried foods in the, in, the, in the schools now. And all these, all these changes were made. And the kids, you know, it, it seems to 
be something they'll eat. And I said, well, what happened? I mean, how come all the other superintendents were telling me they couldn't do it, and all of a sudden you do it? He goes, you know, we looked at it and found out it didn't cost any more. <laughs> I'm thinking, really? I'd, I'd heard that for years. And so, yeah, I mean, it became part of the culture. In other words, you just weren't allowed to, you know, to, to act the way we'd done before. Here's what had happened. With, with the, with what, what MAPS really did, when we built these extraordinary public pro, you know, buildings, we raised the standards. We'd been a city that had been so value conscious, we had no sense of design or ready to pay anything over the minimum cost of what it took to do something. MAPS kind of changed that. We had higher expectations of ourselves. What our program did was it raised the expectations for us. We had never really asked the citizens of Oklahoma City for themselves to do better. They liked the fact the city was looking better and doing better, but we hadn't raised the standards for us. And that's really what, you know, what's taken place. And, you know, it's still got to be people got to make individual decisions. You can't really force people to lose weight regardless of, you know, what you do. And so the idea is that people are making better choices now. Yes? Uh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. He's got the microphone, so I'll, I'll let him ask the question. Okay. Yes? Uh, once again, thank you. Uh, your discussion about culture change within your community, mm -hmm. but also within your staff. The inertia of the infrastructure that you are up against uh -huh. is tremendous. You know, you're talking about 80, 100, 200 years of decisions that now have to be retrofitted. And we see the same thing coming for climate change. And you're on that path already. But it comes down to some of those key, I don't want to say battles, but discussions you have with staff that really are embedded. Mm -hmm. And how did you have to, you know, you talked about that one way you end your conversation by saying we're building a better city. But when that didn't work, when did you have to use the hook? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you asked because, you know, looking back, um, that was incredibly easy. Here's, here's what happened. As you said, the, you know, the civil engineers in the city have been doing it one way. I mean, they had, they had squeezed every cent out of those budgets to do as many roads as possible. And so, I mean, nothing was being done in, in anything above the minimum level. And we did have a change in our, in our public works department during that time period. Had a, had a person who'd been there a long time uh, uh, retired. And so that, that was part of the, the shift. But what happened was that when I started speaking differently and started talking about the things that I've talked about today in this kind of new urbanist and, and you know, kind of complete streets type target, I realized that the enlightenment on our staff already existed. They just needed the freedom to execute. They didn't want to build roads like they were building it. They didn't want to design the city the way it was being designed. They just kind of felt like that's the way it always been. That's what they were supposed to do. And it's almost as if once we started talking about this new way to do things, the veil had been lifted off, an entirely new, you know, new way of looking at, this, at the environment took off. So I really didn't do anything other than just talk about it. We have, you know, a city manager, weak mayor, form of government. And so talking about it is sometimes feels like it's about all I can do. But, but the, the, the staff couldn't be more supportive. And, uh, you know, the, the idea that that TIF that redesigned all the downtown streets, that was mostly their idea. It wasn't mine. And so, you know, they, they saw the idea that to rebuild that built environment. So um, I may have, you know, had the first conversation, but, you know, they did most of the work. So to piggyback on that question, so once you have a city staff that's on board with a kind of new urbanist complete streets vision as you characterize it, how did Oklahoma City build that understanding and support out in the community? Were foundations involved? Were philanthropic organizations involved in getting the word out? How did you build out the understanding amongst city leaders, opinion leaders, that this was the right way to go? Well, it, it was an easy sell. Like I say, I mean, it, it was as if they, you know, no one knew what to do, and suddenly I was offering kind of a, a, a new concept that we can do better, we've got to lose weight, we've got to redesign this city, and the business leaders were kind of all in. But you bring up a very important, important aspect of this, and that's the, the private sector and the nonprofits. We, we keep government pretty lean in Oklahoma. I mean, it's, it's, it's the reddest of red states out there, and people don't, you know, want to be taxed any more than they have to, and it's, it's a fight. But, but what we've noticed is that we are now relying a lot more on the nonprofits for the social services side. And so in dealing with the homeless and dealing with mental illness and all of those aspects, and my view is that when, a, when, a, when an individual person has kind of fallen into that, that uh, uh, intersection of 
mental illness or homelessness or, or uh, uh, you know, poverty, they have an individual situation that requires an individual answer. Government's not real good at individual answers. You know, government's kind of good at one policy that everybody can understand and adhere to. But if you're trying to solve, you know, a, a social issue of that magnitude, it almost takes a private sector or a philanthropic response. I think they're just much better at it. And so we have really relied on, on, on nonprofits. In fact, we became the largest school district in the country with all day fully funded pre-K. It was nonprofits that came together and helped us fund that. It wasn't, you know, government that put in most of the money. Yeah, her, her question is, is there a, there's a lot of them. The Inasmuch Foundation is probably one we rely on a lot. It's, a, it's the Gaylord Families uh, Foundation. But there are several others. Uh, George Kaiser, um, um, one of the wealthiest men in America, lives in Tulsa. And he preferred to invest in Tulsa than Oklahoma City. But occasionally, you know, he'll, he'll do some matching things with some of our philanthropists. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, nonprofit programming going on in Oklahoma City. And, and I don't know where we'd be today without them. You know, when the state got out of the mental health business, you know, those responsibilities fell on local governments. You know, that, and, and so, you know, that's where our, our, you know, our jails are overly populated now trying to deal with the mental illness situation. And we're currently in the process of trying to redesign our entire criminal justice system to be more sensitive and trying to figure out a way to, where we just don't lock up all the poor people who can't afford to get out, because that's what we're doing. Um, and so, but again, you know, it, it, it takes you know, the, kind of the nonprofit side to kind of fill in the gaps on this continuum of care. How are we going to take care of people if we take them out of the, the jail? And so, um, uh, you know, it, it's almost as if our, the, the nonprofit growth is kind of the direct result of Oklahoma City kind of retreating from a lot of those social services uh, that you generally expect government to take care of. We have uh, five more minutes, so if you do a quick question, then we might be able to reach the gentleman over there. Thank you. Um, you kind of, I, I, I laugh because you kind of glazed over the moving of I-40, which is, <laughs> y'all moved a federal interstate. Nobody has ever done that before. Yeah. No city has done that. So my, I have two, two parts of my question is, first of all, how on earth did you pull that off? And second, how is that in, how is that in your mind framed as, as a public health um, Part of the discussion. I mean, why, why was it included in the speech, and what, what are the benefits yeah. that you've seen from? Well, that? the uh, what was happening is we had this elevated segment of I-40. It was like six lanes, and it kind of went through the middle of downtown Oklahoma City. It was constructed in the 1960s. By the 90s, it was in a level of disrepair, and the idea was that it's no longer structurally safe. We're spending millions a year just to keep it upright, and the uh, Department of Transportation came up with three options. And um, the one that was ultimately chosen was a new route for four and a half miles that went through downtown Oklahoma City, moved it down closer to the river, uh, moved it about five blocks, basically. And I was in, uh, I was in the media. I, was, uh, I, I kind of neglected to tell my professional career. I was a television sportscaster news anchor for, for 30 years. But the reason that's important is I was a city hall reporter in the 90s when that discussion was taking place. And, and you said it didn't easy. I was covering city hall when the route was chosen by the city council. And then I cut the ribbon 16 years later as mayor. And so from route chosen to ribbon cutting was 16 years to build four and a half miles of interstate. And what, what had happened was that that bridge had been a barrier for development and growth. And so once we removed it, we were able to build the park that was, that's now under construction and to this kind of, and reopen, you know, kind of a, a new southern part of downtown that had never really had opportunity for for any new development uh, going forward. Did I answer completely your question? Okay, all right. Yes. Yeah, the, uh -huh. the, the question I have has to do with education. You, you mentioned the rebuilding of 75 schools or refurbishing those schools, and that's a structural solution. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the ability to have school, public schools in the inner city is, is essential to preventing the folks from moving to the suburb or choosing charter schools. So what have you done other than the building of the schools in this period of time yeah, to well, deal with that? We have, we have, like a lot of cities, we've kind of struggled on that area. We have, we have pockets of success. Some of the top performing high schools in the country are in downtown Oklahoma City, but also some of the lowest performing in our state are in the inner city. 
the, the biggest problem we have now is just the inconsistency. We have a, a, a large Hispanic population that's repopulated the near city. It's, the, it's, it's like over 40% of the district now. And so you have the language barrier that kind of comes with that and the social economic issues that come with it. And so I'm not suggesting we've resolved the public education aspect to it. I can tell you it's better. And if there's a program out there, we've tried it. And we have built a new downtown grade school that is not only at capacity, there's a waiting list uh, to get in uh, from pre-K all the way up, you know, and it's, it's growing, adding, adding a year, you know, every year to it. Uh, so there's no question that the, with new buildings is an improvement because here, here's one thing the new buildings did. It made a kid more likely to want to be there in school. It made a teacher more likely to want to teach at that school. And it made a parent more likely to want to be there on parent-teacher night. I mean, just the fact that there was a new building. So it did have a, an impact beyond just the construction. But, um, uh, but we still have work to do on, on raising the level of performance in our lowest performing schools. Uh, and we're seeing incremental progress. We've had a series of superintendents who seem to be doing their best. But the entire community is now focused on it. It used to be that it was somebody else's problem. Now the entire community feels the responsibility of, of improving public education for the whole community. So there's, there's a buy-in up here. Yeah. Well, again, I think thank you all. Thanks for being here. It's an amazing story to hear and a lot of lessons and, and a lot of inspiring thoughts for us. I appreciate so thank it. you very thank much. You, Bill. Thank you all. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.